And welcome back to the podcast that must not be named. I am Melissa. I am Luke. And you are here and you've stumbled upon our five chap recap where we are discussing chapters 11 through 15. Chapter 11 is Aboard the Hogwarts Express. Chapter 12, the Triwizard Tournament. Chapter 13, Mad-Eye Moody. Chapter 14, the Unforgivable Curses. And chapter 15, Bobeton and Armstrong. Now we're going to have our special guest, Terrence from Hogwarts Radio, tell us what just happened. Chapter 11, Aboard the Hogwarts Express. We're introduced to the name of Mad-Eye Moody and his former job title as a well-known Auror. We also learn that he is retired. Aboard the Hogwarts Express, we find out that Draco almost went to Durmstrang, another wizarding school, and that Hogwarts is hidden, which apparently Ron had no idea about. And we learn, thanks to her me own uh, er, uh, Hermione, that it is impossible to apparate or disapparate within it. Draco picks on Ron some more, and the train arrives at Hogsmeade Station. Chapter 12, the Triwizard Tournament. The trio arrives at the Great Hall. Peeves causes some mayhem, upset that he wasn't invited to the feast, and we're actually introduced to Mad-Eye, whom the trio notices drinks only from a hip flask, and Dumbledore tells the students of the Triwizard Tournament. The prize, 1,000 galleons. Dumbledore goes on to say that you have to be 17 to enter, and that students from Bobatons and Durmstrang will be arriving shortly. Chapter 13, Mad-Eye Moody. A new term officially begins and students head off to classes. Harry looks for, but does not receive, a message from Sirius in the Morning Post. We head off to Herbology, Care of Magical Creatures, and Divination. Later in the evening, while in line for dinner, Draco reads aloud from the Daily Prophet about Mr. Weasley being slammed in an article by that bit uh, uh, witch, Rita Skeeter. Mad-Eye Moody tells Draco to warn his father that he will be watching his son and comments that he and Mr. Malfoy are old acquaintances. Chapter 14, The Unforgivable Curses. Professor Snape is his usual cheerful self. He definitely doesn't take his frustrations with Moody out on students. We're introduced to the three unforgivable curses and Moody demonstrates them. Neville, haunted by the memories of the Cruciatus curse, is visibly shook. Moody notices this after class and pulls Neville aside for a cup of tea. When the trio returns to the common room later, Neville is reading a book Moody gave him titled Magical Mediterranean Water Plant and their properties. Hermione returns from the library intending to start an organization she calls SPEW, the Society for the Promotion of Elvish Welfare. She coerces Harry and Ron into being officers. Hedwig delivers a message from Sirius Black. Harry's painful scar and other events concern him. He is returning to England. Harry frets, fearing that he has put Sirius in danger by complaining about his scar. Chapter 15, Bo Battens and Durmstrang. Classes are getting more difficult in defense against the dark arts, Moody uses the imperious curse on students to teach them how to resist it. Harry feels euphoric while he is cursed. When a little voice breaks in telling him to jump on Moody's desk, Harry thinks, but why? As the command gets more forceful, Harry both jumps and tries to prevent himself from jumping and smashes into Moody's desk. Moody is overjoyed and repeats the process four times until Harry is able to cast off the curse perfectly. The castle is cleaned the next week, and on the day the visitors are to arrive, the Great Hall is decorated with silk banners representing the four houses. Classes end early, and students are marshaled outside the entrance hall. At dusk, Bow Battens arrives in a giant flying carriage pulled by enormous winged horses. Emerging from the carriage, the headmistress, Madame Maxine, is revealed to be as large as Hagrid. Professor Dumbledore greets her and assures her Hagrid is quite capable of tending to the horses, although Madame Maxine expresses some concern. Durmstrang arrives in a sailing ship surfacing from beneath the lake. Headmaster Igor Karkaroff warmly greets Dumbledore, then asks to proceed immediately to the castle, saying Victor has a slight cold. Ron recognizes Victor as the Bulgarian Quidditch seeker Victor Crumb. And now we have your favorite participant, our target audience perspective, Lorelai. Thank you for joining us. Hello. 
fan yeah. favorite here. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're a fan favorite. Yeah. You get I get all, all the comments fan mail. on, I get more like comments and mail on how funny you are than the rest of us. So that makes okay. me feel really good about our work. So famous. So famous. Can you take that? So famous. Can you use your Instagram followers to help build us up? That'd be great. Yeah. Follow me on Instagram at lowcrow565. <laughs> Welcome. All right. All right, Luke, you want to kick us off with chapter 11 questions? Yeah. So aboard the Hogwarts Express, chapter 11. So this is leaving the burrow and the whole train ride back to Hogwarts. What what jumped out at you here uh, in this chapter? Anything specifically? I thought it was hilarious that Miss Weasley pulled off a mom thing. And I was just like, I'm not going to tell you what it is, haha. And then the kids are like so suspicious, like, oh my god, why don't you tell me? Like, I thought it was hilarious. And that's what my mom does all the time. Your mom sounds awesome. She sounds delightful. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that scene as well with Mrs. Weasley and Bill and Charlie are kind of egging them yeah. on a bit too. Yeah, they're like trying to give them hints though, but Miss Weasley is just quiet. It's it's almost like they scripted that ahead of time. Like, hey, let's all just have like something to frustrate them because we <laughs> know and you don't. <laughs> Yeah, they like they're in the kitchen before they all wake up. They're just like making notes, writing down. Okay, you say this, <laughs> and then I'll jump in with this, and then you tag it out. Okay, okay, break. <laughs> so then we're also on the train itself, and we have uh, you know Draco Malfoy stopping in to chat yeah. with his buddies, um, and yeah. a few other things on the on the train. What do you what did you like here? I didn't like any. Um, I didn't like how Draco Malfoy had to tell us what was going on at Hogwarts. Because, like, almost told. Almost told. He'll be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you, like, didn't know this. Like, I thought your dad was, like, famous or whatever. I don't know. I guess you're not that important. Yeah. Ugh. I guess, I, you're, I guess your dad's like, too junior. Yeah. I just got, like, really mad. I was like, but, like, you don't know the whole story. <laughs> I was like, read the book. <laughs> so yeah. then we actually get to Hogwarts in Chapter 12, um, where we have the Triwizard Tournament being announced and a, a new sorting as well. And some, you know, as Melissa would put it, peeves love going on. Um, any any thoughts here in this, this chapter? Mm -hmm. No, but I had a question in this chapter that I realized. Sure. It was like, do they have taxes in the wizarding world? I know this is totally off topic, but like, that's what came in my head on this chapter. It was like, do they have taxes in this? Okay, I want to know how did that, like, what spurred that thought? <laughs> I don't know. Well, because, like, they were talking about, like, all the food and stuff. And I was like, how do they pay for all that? And mm -hmm. I was like, wait, are there, like, taxes or something? Like, like to pay for Hogwarts? In the yeah, family? and I was like, like, how much do they have to pay for Hogwarts and all the food every day? Three meals a day. Like, is there, is it a cost to parents to pay for Hogwarts? Is it publicly funded? If so, yeah. how, do the, how does the government get their money? Mm -hmm. Those are all good questions. I don't mm -hmm. know. Luke, any thoughts? Um, I believe in book one, we found out that um, there's a special fund for students whose parents have a hard time paying for school. Um, so I, I believe it's all privately funded, um, tuition based. Uh, there could be some government assistance. I don't. It's never <laughs> specifically stated, but um, I believe a lot of it is privately funded um, through tuition and room and board from the parents, uh, which definitely is a lot to ask of the Weasleys. But there you go. That's where all their money goes. And they're not paying for, you know, kitchen help because Hermione, as Hermione finds out, slave labor made this meal. Yeah. Hey, neighbor. I, like, your debts are paid because you don't pay for labor. Yeah. I was like, why? Well, when I was like, when will Hermione ever realize that? Like, I don't like slave labor either. Like, it's like, I thought it was totally dumb. But then, like, once, like, I got to know, like, how much they, like, how much the elves loved it, then I was like, okay, you do you. You do it. Have fun. Let's talk about Hermione and her quest for elf liberation. The spew? Sure. How do you feel about that? Do you feel like, first of all, do you agree with her sentiment, what she's trying to do? I, I don't. I agree with her, like, yeah, like, everyone should have their own, like, 
freedom and stuff. I totally agree with that. But like, if they love doing that, if they love that's what Hagrid tells us. Yeah, being the, the like the slave, then like just let them do what they love. Like you can't stop them from doing what they love. If they love it, then let them do it. But if like they don't like it, then like Chris. What if they just don't know any better? Well, then that's their problem. <laughs> but I think she's trying if, to make it. Yeah, but if they love it, then they're fine, even if they don't know anything. Better. Okay. Ignorance can be bliss, apparently. Yeah. I wouldn't know. Yeah. So the other another item that we have here in chapter twelve is Colin Creevy's younger brother showing up and a new sorting hat song. Uh, what'd you think of the the new sorting and Harry not realizing it was a new song every year? I thought it was hilarious because like we haven't heard one since a new one since now because Harry hasn't heard one since now and like I thought it was really cool how like he like comes up with a new one every year and he's been alive for like. How long? A thousand years. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, something like that. And, like, I just thought it was really interesting, like, how a hat could come up with a thousands, thousands, and thousands of different songs, like, like that mean the same thing, that mean, like, I'm the sorting hat, I sort you into your house, Huff Buff Brave, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I thought it was, like, really talented of him. I have a theory. Yeah. I think he only has seven songs. Think about it. If you have seven songs, no kid will ever hear the same song twice because every kid's only there every seven years. Yeah. You have seven versions. And you just rotate. Mm -hmm. Unless you get really bored one year. Yeah. But, like, what does he do in his spare time? Like, all year long. He brings swords of Gryffindor to Gryffindor students in Chambers of Secrets. He protects a shelf from gathering dust. (laughs) But before Harry came along. He protects a shelf from gathering dust by being the the shelf cover. I imagine he chats with Dumbledore here and there. And yeah. He might just like hang out with Phoenix too. There you go. We'll hang out with the box. It'll be fine. Sure. Maybe maybe there's other like talking items in Dumbledore's office. We Mm. just haven't seen them. Maybe they have like a whole little society up in there that we don't know about. Maybe there are pictures in there too that like I don't know, like old headmasters or something. Yeah, could be. Yeah. I don't know. All right. So let's move on to chapter thirteen where we have Mad Eye Moody. Kind of yeah. formally introduced. Oh, and at the Great Feast, we had Moody's entrance into the at, mm-hmm. into the hall as well. I loved that entrance. It was like so dramatic and everything. And like it scripted it very well, like the storm, and then just, oh, I'm here. <laughs> would you like to make an entrance somewhere like that? Yes, of course I would. I just Your own like, lightning flash, <laughs> Lorelai. <laughs> Mad Eye, Lorelai. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I will not care that you are not clapping for me because I clap for myself. <laughs> <laughs> so this chapter 13 is kind of our first day back in classes. We have Herbology with the Bubo Turbers. We have Hagrid's class with the blast Scrutes Scroots and Divination <laughs> and the amazing bouncing ferret Draco Malfoy. Yeah. What'd you, what, anything jump out at you in this chapter? I love Mad Eye Moody because he just gets the mean guy. And I think his, like, reasoning was very well. Like, I don't like it when you have your opponent's back turned on you and then you shoot, because that's just, like, a wimpy thing to do. I, I thought that was really, like... Against the rules of the duel. Yeah. And I thought, like, the scrooge from Hagrid was, like, very cool. Because, like, what Hermione said, like, like you, like, you need drag- like dragons, like, something is very important. Right. But, blood. yeah, blood. But, like, you don't want a dragon as a pet. Like, that could be the same for these. And, like, I thought that was a very good, like, kind of comeback from what Draco said. That is three for three of us who disagree with your mother's perspective on Blast and Scroots. And she actually agrees with what Hermione said at the end, that we should stamp the whole lot out. And, uh, that's terrible. No, no. no. I'm not commenting. I'm going to let you guys just move on. Falcon does not agree with that. (laughs) Neither does Cap. Look at his face. Look at him. He's very mad at you. For those of you who can't see, Lorelai's backdrop is the Avengers for right now. So They're all very mad at you. They're coming for you. That's fine. They're two-dimensional. I'll be okay. Maybe. Maybe two-dimensional is better. All know. right. Can we talk about divination yeah. and how <laughs> Professor Trelawney predicted that Harry was born in the winter? Yeah. That was funny to me. What do you think about that? I thought that was hilarious. Because. He was like, you were born in the winter, right? He's like, no, 
I was born in the summer in total opposite thing. I felt like everyone would just laugh after that and she'd be like, excuse me, and just walk away. She'd be like, yes, excuse me. And like, when, what was Harry said of like, how, like, it's really sleep, like, you get really sleepy in there because of the perfume, I would be out in a second. I would just walk in there, getting ready for nap time, and just <laughs> out. Excellent. Scheduled naps. Yes. All right. What about moving on to chapter 14, the unforgivable curses? Mm-hmm. I thought that. I thought that he was totally going to get in trouble. Mad Eye Moody, I thought he was, like, totally going to get in trouble. I thought, like, for sure, like, I don't know, something would have happened, and he would totally get in trouble for doing it. But at the same Like, from time, Dumbledore or someone? No, not from Dumbledore, because Dumbledore agreed from, like, oh, a okay. teacher, from, like, Snape or something, maybe. I don't know. Like, McGonagall's going to storm in and say, what are you doing now? Yeah. And I thought, like, but I thought it was, like, really cool, kind of, to, like, see that kind of stuff. But at the same time, like, terrifying. So do you think he should be showing that? And then in Chapter 15, actually performing some of those curses on kids? I think that he should show them. I didn't think it was a smart idea to perform it on them. But, like, it was the one that he could make them do something. And, like, right. he's not going to make them, like, fall off, like, Hogwarts or something. He's just going to make them, like, from what Harry did, like, jump on a table or do tap dance or something. And they give a laugh about it. Uh-huh. So it's it's a bit more of a, a safe and trusting environment to yeah. to be exposed to this is what you're you're going for. But I feel like they would have to like not on the second day of like that they he ha- that they have him, I felt I feel like I would need to like trust him a little bit more before he can like put me under one of the deadliest curses ever. I, so like that could kill me. So. I think it was a couple weeks later. Yeah, but it was only, like, the second class that they had, I thought. Well, I don't think we saw them all. I think it was more like it was October, so we assume that a month or a month and a half had gone by. Yeah. yeah. Then, then I would have crushed him. Yeah, I think it's a couple of weeks later, because they've... Um, they talk about how they're starting to get a whole bunch of homework from all of their mm-hmm. classes over the first several weeks of class. So, yeah, I, I think we've been there for, we'll say, six weeks, or, you know, maybe two months at this point. Mm-hmm. So... A little bit more trusting. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was the second day, and I was like, I am not going to let you put me under one of the deadliest curses in the world when I've known you for, like, not even two hours. All right, who wants to try Avada Kedavra real quick? Uh, who no, volunteers? I, uh, no, I'm good. <laughs> I'll do it on you, okay? It won't hurt. It won't hurt, I swear. Oh, I'm just tickle. What do you think of Moody's magical eye? That was really cool. Because, like, he could see through, like, wood and, like, see in the back of his head. I thought that was awesome. Like, the little thing that, like, your mom says to you all the time, like, I can see through the back of my head. You just can't see my eyes back there. I thought it was something like that, <laughs> mother. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I got one. I'm fine. It comes you with the mother manual. You don't have There's a handbook. No, you don't have one. <laughs> you don't know. So let's talk mm-hmm. about the other schools mm-hmm. and the Triwizard Tournament that's coming. I had a question about that. Sure. Who, who came up with the Triwizard Tournament? I feel like, I don't know, one headmaster was just like bored one day and was just like, you know what we should have? Triwizard Tournament. Let's we'll bring other like, schools in. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll bring other schools in and we'll kill kids. <laughs> I mean, doesn't that sound fun? You can see them die. That's fun. No, that's called Hunger Games. Right? Yeah. They're like, have you ever seen the movie Hunger Games? <laughs> Like, I saw this one muggle watching it, and it was really cool, and I think we should try it. May the odds be ever in your favor. Yeah, but instead of that, we have, like, a lot of cadavers. Great. Yeah, I said, I was like, who came up with that? And we even quit, canceled Quidditch for this. Yeah, I was like... I was like, well, I was like, why would you quit Quidditch? Like, it's not gonna hurt anyone. Like, if you keep on, like, playing Quidditch. And they're like, well, the teachers are just, like, overwhelmed. And I was like, okay, so they're supposed to be overwhelmed. Like, why don't they just do something else? Like, one little thing. That's what I thought. Okay. Any thoughts on the two schools that are coming in? Beaubaton and Durmstrang. Bobaton sounds like a French place. Okay. I see. I think they will only know how to speak French, and it'll be very hard to communicate with them. That's what I think. I think they're string, you know, they just sound like Hogwarts, kind of like a normal group of kids. Okay. Do you have any other thoughts that you'd like to share on your notes before we get into your five burning questions? No. All right. Here we go. Ready? Yeah. 
Question number one. Would you like to have a fur cape as part of your school uniform like the Durmstrang students? No. Why not? I would call that, like, animal leash. I would not want to wear it at all. Not that I'm, like, vegan or anything. I just think that animal animals have lives, too. So PETA would put you as a spokesperson? Yeah. All right. Question number two. If you were to win the Triwizard Tournament, what would you do with the 1,000 Galleon prize money? I'd save it for my future and my kids' future. Oh, so you'd be boring. You wouldn't, like, go out and buy yourself a motorcycle or anything? No. Fiscally responsible is what she is. Yeah. (laughs) All right, fine. I'm very proud of you. That's a very good (laughs) answer. These things. I'm a little bored by it, but I'm very proud of you. But... You're welcome. I'm making a good decision, and you're like being so mean about it. Yeah, because I would go on a trip. Wow. Don't guilt her into bad money habits. No. <laughs> you All need right. to for trips with your family. And yeah, you, if up. I want, you'd come with me. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Oh, question okay. three. Which okay. sounds worse? Squeezing booboo tubers for the pus or raising blast and scroots? Which one is worse? Good. Why? No, I was just repeating it. I don't actually. Oh. Which one would be worse? Raising the the blast and scroots or squeezing those booba tubers to get their pus out? I think raising blast and scroots would be worse because you have to do it like all the time. So you gotta raise them for like weeks. And then like just doing the pus thing, you like probably only had to do it for one class. Aha. Uh-huh. So you're going with the pus. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Makes me feel a little better. Question four, t- question four, which one is worse? And it's a lot of these, right? Which one is worse? The Imperious Curse or the Cruciatus Curse? Isn't the Imperious Curse the one where they tell you what to do? Yeah, like the mind control. Yeah, like, hmm. Yep, and Cruciatus is like agonizing pain. Mm-hmm. I think the Cruciatus Curse would be worse. The pain one? Yeah, because like they could tell you to just like instantly just kill yourself. Just like, boom, kill yourself. And they'd be like, okay, that's dead. The other one, you like go for like minutes and minutes of just straight up pain. Okay. Yep. Of course, with the Imperius curse, you could also be mind controlled for years. Yeah, I think the Imperius still worse. Yeah. Okay. Question fifteen. My opinion. That's fine. You're. That's why we ask you things. So My we get. opinion. Uh, okay. Question five. <laughs> Which school's entrance to Hogwarts school grounds was more impressive? I think. Bo- not Boba Tong. Durmstrang? Durmstrang, yes. With the boat? Yeah. I thought that was like total Pirates of the Caribbean stuff where they get like... <laughs> I thought that was really cool. All right. Yeah, fly- Flying Dutchman style. Yeah. Or Jack Sparrow's first entrance in the first movie with his boat. He's standing up on the... <laughs> yeah. If I was Jack Sparrow, I would probably make this face every time. I'd just be like... <laughs> All right, two more. Ready? Yeah. What was your favorite line? My favorite line. Oh, and I gotta find it in my notes. I have a favorite line. I swear, I have a favorite line. Excuse me for one moment. Favorite line. Here we go. It's like a cat covered in potato peelings. I thought that was hilarious. Was Say like, that again. What? It's like a cat covered in potato peelings. It's in chapter 11, where, like, the man in the fire is talking to Mr. Weasley about, like, the whole thing at mad Moody's house, and he's, like, describing the little guys. It's like a cat with potato peeling in back. That line is not familiar to me at all. <laughs> it's a lie! I believe you. I just, as for some reason, never caught my attention. I don't know. I... I just thought it was hilarious because I heard I heard potato peelings and went back and it was like it's like a cat covered in potato peelings and I just thought that was really random and weird so I loved it. Melissa and I are both trying to look it up real quick. I right. know. It's like a cat covered in potato. Here we go. So I found it. <clears throat> Made one hell of a noise and fired rubbish everywhere as far as I can tell, said Mr. Diggory. Apparently, one of them was still rocketing around when the police men turned up, Mr. Weasley groaned. 
And what about the intruder? Arthur, you know Mad-Eye, said Mr. Diggory's head, rolling its eyes again. Someone creeping into his yard in the dead of night? More likely, there's a very shell-shocked cat wandering around somewhere covered in potato peelings. But if the improper use of magic lot get their hands on Mad-Eye, he's had it. Think of his record. A cat covered in potato peelings. I thought that was hilarious. That's really funny, and I've never thought of it that way before. That is a really good cat. I just like her potato feelings, and I was just like, yes. <laughs> yeah, I always get hung up on the please men. That's that's yeah, the thing too. that sticks with me. I, I appreciate the cat covered in potato feelings. That's awesome. A shell shocked cat. cat. A shell shocked cat in, covered in potato feelings. That's, that's awesome. awesome. I you said that. I was like, awful. "Is are those really the words that she's saying? I don't understand how I don't know this. <laughs> I, I know all of those words are this language that I speak, but I don't understand how they form one single thought. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. All right. Well picked. Ooh, now it brings us to your most valuable person for this section. Who is your MVP? My MVP is Mad Eye Moody. I have very good. I have very good with him. <clears throat> yeah, I got my notes out. <clears throat> because shh, I'm talking to me. Listen. Because he gave a very amazing speech about how you heard had to be prepared for the dark arts. I thought it was awesome. Like Constant. he gave a good speech. He gave an amazing entrance. He totally destroyed Draco Malfoy. He is just the best so far. Constant vigilance. Yes, constant vigilance. I know it may seem harsh, but you've got to know. You have yeah. to know what's out there. Like, he gave so many amazing things in this book. One-liners left and right. Mm-hmm. Every time you saw him, boom, dramatic entrance. <laughs> He's definitely uh, made his yes. impression well-known. Diva. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think smart. All right. Hey, I, I think that wraps us up with you. Okay. All right. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Five chapters left. Yeah. And then like 20 more after that. But it's fine. Mm-hmm. All right. We'll see you in about six weeks. Yeah. Great. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Lorelai. My cat and potatoes. Well, we're back here and we're 15 chapters through book four. And we have a person who's reading this for the first time. Welcome back, Riley. Hey, what's going on? How you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, Welcome back for break. Thank you. Yeah, I'm in the studio. It feels good. Man, I, I don't even know what to do with myself. If You're Luke, here. If Luke insults me, I can slap him. So. <laughs> I say in general, just err on the side of slapping whenever you want. <laughs> I don't think there even needs to be a real reason. But that's just me. Right. All right. So we are, like I said, 15 chapters into this book. Um, first 10 chapters sounded like had a thumbs up from Riley. Overall feelings on on this section. Um, this section kind of delved a little bit back into that, like, um, beginning of school stuff. A lot of build up to what the actual story or the plot of the book's going to be like. But it wasn't. I don't know if I'm just like numb to it now, and I don't. I, I expect it, and I don't mind too much, or that it's getting better and less. Um, not not pointless but monotonous i guess for like these chapters um but there's a lot of build up there's a lot of like hanging um like i don't know what the word is um like cliffhangers i guess like just just not explaining everything outright sure kind of having secrets about the triwizard tournament what is it going to be about like a lot of the conversations in the earlier chapters where we don't really there's this big secret and then they tell us but we still don't really know what's going on yet so um i'm excited to, is i'm excited to keep reading because i feel like we're going to get into some good stuff but overall they were pretty good okay um so so, chapter 11. Aboard the Hogwarts Express. Choo-choo. Choo-choo. Uh, thoughts on our journey, ba- journey back to Hogwarts here? Um, it was uh, pretty pretty typical. You know, we had the, the patented uh, Malfoy interaction on the train and... Um, you know, just hanging out with the crew, driving along. But we also, before we got to the train, had a little bit of conversation with uh, Arthur Weasley and Mrs. Weasley. And um, was it Mr. Diggory was there? In the morning? Yeah. The very, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, his head was in the fire. Yeah, so we got a little bit more of that um, adult wizard stuff going on, a little bit more conversation. Um, we see that this is where we really get the idea that the adults know that there's something going on and the students don't um even like charlie weasley's like you i might see you guys again sooner than you'd think so um still don't know why i mean i'm assuming that's 
related to the tournament now that mm-hmm. I know about it later in the section, but I wonder what role he'll play, mm-hmm. which is interesting. Um, and then we get the big thing for chapter 11 for me was we learn about, um, Durmstrang is another school that has a secret location that we don't know where it is. And somebody mentioned that there's a lot of rivalry between the schools, which is cool. I mean, great rivalry, but why don't they play Quidditch against each other? Like, Ooh, that's a good point. Wh- if they really have a rivalry, then how do they show that? How do they compete with that? I, I don't know. I thought that was, I thought that was silly or not silly, but interesting that like, let's use the rivalry to something that more people can jump on board right. with. I, uh, that's actually something I've thought about as well. Like if we if we go from hey you have six game or no there's there are six matches total right. at Hogwarts every year. You have three opponents. It seems like they get kind of stale. Like the inner house inner mural rivalry. Sure, that's going to be pretty solid. But like to go from oh we just graduated seventh year and now we're going to like the Quidditch minor leagues. Like what what's the transition yeah. from you play only your classmates to professional league level? Like where it's seems like there needs to be some interaction if these are the three european schools that we've heard of they should be playing each yeah other. i, I guess <laughs> what's the uh, club sport or what's the club sports league for quidditch right <laughs> like, like the next level up, get out of the rec league let's move up to what is it like the european minor league swimming yeah. not swimming but minor league quidditch playing and yeah, no, that's a that's a that's a really good point. I, it's something that definitely has stuck out to me too. Um, not specifically the way that you came across right. it, but um, so what else happened in early in that chapter? Anything we had? Yeah, like you said, Bill and Charlie seem to know things that are kind of leading the kids along, and we have Draco who just can't, just is incapable of not stopping by. <laughs> Yeah. Like, no and, one invited you, Draco. And even Harry's like, you know, you don't have to come in right. here. Like, that's fine. <laughs> and it was all just because, like, the door was cracked or whatever and, on in the cart. Yeah. They specifically avoided see, like, going by their yeah. cart earlier. Like, he <laughs> heard into it and was like, I'm not going to deal with that. And Very much a, a one-sided animosity, I think. At this point, yeah. <laughs> so, chapter 12 was? Uh, the Triwizard Tournament. Okay, so this is the introduction to the tournament first first day back at school mm-hmm. uh, or just the first day kind uh, of the, the, the feast itself. yeah the feast and getting to the school and everything and some peeves action yeah the peeves water bomb dropping on people like come on man it's the first day back i, I like peeves but it's already raining like i guess that's his reason like they're already wet which is funny it's goofy but it's all, he's not hurting anybody he's not doing anything that is, they're not already being. He's not causing any more trouble. He's just like the annoying kid, like the the, the one from um, uh, the Polar Express, the annoying kid with glasses. That's how yes. I imagine Peeves. Um, but we get uh, some cool things that we have in here. Are Colin Creevy has a little brother, so I'm assuming that's going to get annoying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But that's okay. Um, and then the hat, the hat spends all year making a song, uh, to sing a different song every year, apparently. And I mean, that's news to us, right? We just read that, but did it really take Harry three years to realize that there's a new song every year? It's the first time he's been back. <laughs> yeah. In his defense, oh, yeah. he's never he heard it. He missed years two and three. Yeah. Because year two, he was car. flying in a car and year three, he was. In... being yelled at no it was the he dem- and hermione were pulled aside hermione was pulled aside oh, yeah. for time turner. Turner, and he was like being checked out by madame pomfrey because he had um passed out yeah the collapsed on that right. train yeah. so this is this is the first time back. that makes sense and i i like the way that it was uh interacted um because I, I like that it happened on page that he didn't realize that. Yeah. I, I just think that was brilliant by JK. To no, be like, definitely. Yeah, yeah we're, this is a way that we keep it fresh around here. And well, only Harry and doesn't know that. <laughs> I don't think as a reader, I would have realized it if she didn't point it out. Oh, I, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, cause you're just going along. It's just another year. You don't realize <laughs> until. <laughs> You don't realize until it's kind of mentioned out like, oh, we've never heard a song. Oh, wait, neither has Harry. Yeah, I mean, I'm just realizing that now. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, that's funny. All right. So so what do you think about the canceled Quidditch? Um, canceled Quidditch. Uh, it seems a little like extra. I mean, I don't, I don't know how important extra. this tournament is. Yeah. Or like how involved. involved it will be. They say that, I mean, there's obviously a, a small staff 
around Hogwarts and apparently they're going to be doing a lot. So I understand <laughs> it, but like, I mean, what does that mean? Do, do they have no practice now? And I mean, we, saw, we later in the chapters, we hear that Harry says, you know, he's missing those uh, training sessions. Like, mm -hmm. they just don't practice at all for a year. Like, that's no, kind there's of literally no physical education yeah. at the school. <laughs> None. <laughs> there it went. <laughs> yeah, it's a little ridiculous, but they're, they're fattening them all up this year. Must be. Um, I don't know. I think it's hopefully it makes sense later on, and maybe there's just not enough time to focus on Quidditch when, like, I don't, I don't know. I think I wish that we had it, but maybe it'll be worth not having it later. So sure, I feel like they maybe. should still be able to go out and fly around. Yeah, <laughs> like <laughs> I think they could still have the matches, but that's my own two cents. They, I feel like the students should organize some kind of like scrimmage league you know it's like no ref we're just gonna go play and not take it too seriously somebody will die speaking of organizing we've got hermione who starts her her foods her starvation strike uh here at the the feast as well yeah um and then as it kind of progresses well she that's where she she learns of uh the misjudge or the the unjustness mm -hmm. in hogwarts injustice not unjustness i like injustice. i like unjustness <laughs> The unjustifiability of it. True. <laughs> so what, what do you think about Hermione's uh, plight here and uh, the way she's going about combating that? Um, I think it's noble. I think she's going about it the completely wrong way. Um, I don't think that she understands, uh, she doesn't, so Hermione's very, um, uh, intellectual about the wizarding world and knows a lot of factual stuff, but I feel like she's very uneducated on the social aspect of a lot of the wizarding world. And so, or I, just people. Yeah, exactly. People in general. And so I think that that is where, um, her like differences between the way Ron sees the situation, so somebody like Ron would see the situation and the way she sees the situation. And that's kind of why uh, I think it's written down maybe in 14 or 15, but uh, a lot of the students kind of think that her light is sort of a joke almost um and not like i said I, I think her intentions are correct but for this world that is not a real world um if the house elves really do enjoy being house elves and doing what they have been doing for centuries then maybe just because you think it's wrong doesn't mean you're right i don't know how so, to explain that so i i know i've i've mentioned this before so bear with me listeners uh, but riley hasn't heard this yet um, but it's a, a comparison I think he'll appreciate. I, I see Hermione very much similar to Daenerys Targaryen in Game of Thrones, trying to abolish slavery sure. in Slaver's Bay. Yeah, they don't. Even the slaves don't necessarily want the slavery on on the surface. So how do you kind of combat that? Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of the issue she's running into. Is how do you convince somebody who's never had the idea of freedom understand that? You deserve this, like regardless of how societal norms are mm -hmm. set. And so that's what she's going up against. And I think you're completely right. It's like this I, might not be the best way of going about it. And there's no doubt her intentions are right. It's a very difficult right. problem. I think it would be better if she would take the time to go and talk to maybe Dobby or other house elves that maybe have, you know, that have that opportunity in their mind, you know, that possibility of being free and, and maybe getting their side of the story so that she's fighting for them and not for a, a principle, you know? Mm -hmm. She's almost taking what could be considered like an oppressive colonialist type approach to it. She She's like aggressively trying to fix this mm -hmm. and instead of going and trying to learning more about it from the core and building up from there. Right. So I, I think, yeah, she needs a little more information and stop attacking your friends. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> you're not going to fix the problem by attacking people. I don't think what she stands for is wrong. I just think the way that she has she's maybe got, started going of, about it. A lot of learning to do. Yeah, definitely. Hermione doesn't people well in general. No, <laughs> not at all. But she also doesn't take advice very well. Mm -mm. It's not like she realizes she doesn't people she thinks she's fine because she just is right i think the she last part of her. that is uh she feels a little betrayed by hogwarts a history yeah that it's like that's out. funny yeah <laughs> I, I thought I wrote that down, but I didn't. That that line was really funny. Like Hogwarts, a revised history, or Hogwarts, <laughs> a history that skips over the gloss, the bad glossy parts of the, that of the school. Over the more dirty or, yeah. aspects of the school. <laughs> that's hilarious. Um. So that's kind of 
most of 12 is just that um, so, feast stuff. So then 13, we get into the first day of classes. Mm-hmm. Um, so we meet the Bubo Turbo Puss. We, we meet the Glass and its Scroots. Yep. Um, thoughts on, sure. on this? What's going on here? Um, I like that we are... So I know that I always complain about the beginning of school stuff, but I like that we're actually kind of diving into what's happening in the classes more. Like, we get to know what they're learning about in divination we get to know who they're ra- like what they're raising in care of magical creatures i Hold mean on. are they actually learning in divination though well i mean what they're being exposed to yeah lectured, lectured okay. on sorry i just uh, clarification go on Definitely. continue your list um and then uh like even with later on in the next chapter with the curses like we, we we're just getting more in depth i think on each individual class like what we're kind of learning which is cool um the big part of this chapter is obviously uh, getting a first look at Mad Eye Moody. That's what it's called. Is Mad Eye Moody? It's chapter thirteen, and the whole um, Draco ferret, uh, <laughs> the amazing bouncing ferret. <laughs> yeah, uh, which was really funny. Um, I like that. It, Hermione did have a good point though. Like Moody could have really hurt Draco, which. Good thing McGonagall stopped them, but it was from our side of the the coin pretty enjoyable. Um, and then the uh, Rita Skeeter and Arnold Weasley, uh, <laughs> yeah. which is pretty funny. It's very kind of how typical or Malfoy says it's like a typical thing that Arthur Weasley wouldn't even have his name like said right, which is not wrong. Like it's pretty funny that he does have his name spelled wrong. Um, uh, which I mean is good for him because if somebody would to complain about it, he'd be like that was Arnold. Well, that wasn't plausible know. deniability. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> It wasn't it, me. It was the one armed man. This, this is again one of those. Uh, the Malfoys are so frustrating because they make fairly accurate mm-hmm. points <laughs> and just take it in a very negative connotation way. Yeah. So that's what that's why it feels so so much worse. It's so much dirtier because you're like he's not really wrong. <laughs> yeah. It's just that I mean I'll always try to err on the side of Slytherin, but the thing that I don't like about Draco and seemingly his father as well is that yes they're ambitious, but they always use other people to like take a step on to push themselves up instead of like their users yeah which is frustrating but there's people like that all over so they're real it gets pretty good character so Mm -hmm. but yeah that was kind of a short chapter it was just kind of that situation and then meeting mad eye moody and then we go on to chapter 14 the unforgivable curses which was a pretty cool chapter i thought there was a lot in there um the most surprising thing so we get uh moody's lecture of uh these are the curses these are what they do and i'm not supposed to teach them to you i'm just supposed to teach you uh counter charms or counter spells which he says that dumbledore okays it i don't know if i buy that 100 i don't know if Moody's necessarily doing everything being told by Dumbledore that he's like everything that he's doing is he's being instructed to do. Does that make sense? Like mm-hmm. as in he's sort of making his own agenda and then um just saying, "Oh yeah, I was told I could do this." Yeah. I I don't know why uh, if that's true or not, but I I definitely think that there's something going on with him. Not that I don't trust him, but I definitely think he's kind of awesome. Yeah, he is pretty cool, but it's always the really cool ones that make you like them right away that probably have something going on i feel like yeah that's true so here's here's the specific line about it i just i I have it written down here so i want to break it out now according to the ministry of magic i'm supposed to teach you counter curses and leave it at that i'm not supposed to show you what illegal dark curses look like until you're in sixth year you're not supposed to be old enough to deal with it till then but professor dumbledore's got higher opinion of your nerves he reckons you can cope and i say the sooner you know what you're up against the better i I don't know i I, i'm not saying that i disagree with you just feels like he's here for one year specifically on Dumbledore's request. Right. This is like specifically his skill set. Why? Like if he's only got Moody here for a year, I could see I, personally, I'm not too surprised by Dumbledore kind of eschewing the Ministry of Magic and being like, this is pretty important. I've got the guy. Yeah. Let's let's use the tools that I have. Yeah, I agree. I kind of felt like that at first, but then later on we we get to, to we get to talking about how uh, every time moody says or teaches something it seems like they're going to be attacked the next day is what ron says like so i i feel like i don't know i feel like there's just something that either moody knows or maybe it is dumbledore maybe dumbledore is person like purposely doing this but i feel like there's something up that but i also think 
Medi maybe had a life. I think we've said this that he was attacked right. a lot. Like that's his natural state of Paranoia. being. Yeah, you know. I mean, he had a or, thing with the dust. What is thought- it? Um, uh, conviction or uh, constant vigilance? Constant vigilance. He's had a life of constant vigilance because he's always right. had to be. Does that make sense? And if he's brought in to be the professor of defense against the dark arts, that's been his entire life. Now we may not necessarily agree with his method of vigilance but it he's alive isn't he yeah and his teaching seems to be sticking with the kids whether that's I mean, it's highly engaging yeah highly engaging very impressionable <laughs> like, yeah. it's certainly leaving an impression on everybody <laughs> because think of the way the twins and lee jordan talk about him before the fourth years even have him they're like holy cow like talk about a guy who's seen it before like it just mm-hmm. leaves <laughs> everyone in awe like i don't know to me it seems like a highly highly effective way to create <laughs> (laughs) Like you said, a very engaged student body. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) So, again, I'm not saying that I disagree with you. Um, I think it's a really interesting topic because Moody is a very interesting guy. Yeah. Yes, he is. I also like that. So we kind of saw that Hardy or hardened part of him in class or I guess he probably and after I think he was actively choosing to be that way maybe I mean maybe he probably is like that uh, but he was probably acting actively choosing to be a little bit more abrasive in his teaching but we get to see that like maybe a softer or more calm side of him when he meets with Harry Hermione Ron and Neville in the mm-hmm. hallway and then yep. takes Neville back to his classroom and has some tea with him and then we find out later he gives him a book so I think that um I think that he is intelligent i i don't i I don't think that he's totally rogue (laughs) no yeah i think he is uh doing things with a purpose and and with thought put into it so i i don't think he i don't necessarily distrust him i just think there's more going on right now that i'm not i don't buy into it yet i don't i don't come not completely team mad eye moody yet okay um, right and then, then we jump to chapter 15, right? Yeah. Uh, Bo Tall and Durham Strang. Yep. Um, I think the first part of this, and then, okay, we just talked about it, but Moody now is putting imperious curses on the students. Mm-hmm. Questionable. This water is questionable to me. Uh, <laughs> Okay, Tantor. <laughs> yeah. um, but I guess we, we kind of already talked about that. It's just... This is a little bit different level than... Showing. Showing. Them. Yeah. I, that's where I'll start conceding. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's a fair point. Putting the curse on them, a little different. With, But again, pretty well justified. Like, if you're going to be put under this, you... This is something we would be surprised with someone who has ill intentions. Right. And it's something that uh, at first in the lesson, I thought it was pretty messed up. But then once I saw that Harry was maybe fighting back about it a little bit, then like, like you said, if somebody's going to be putting it on you, you need to know how to fight back. So like if this, this is definitely the the setting to do that in, Mm -hmm. which was maybe they were a little young, maybe six years, the right year or whatever. But I understand that kind of. Right. That's That's kind of what I'm coming back to. Yeah. Yes. Well, and that's my question for you. Like. Who all do you think is getting this? Is it everybody first year through seventh year? Is it fourth years and up? Is it just fourth years? Is it just Harry's class? I Not think even it's, all the fourth That's years? how I feel about it. I think it's just Harry's class. I think, I don't know. I, I think that there's something that Moody is aware of that he's trying to push onto Harry or at least somebody in Harry's class. I, we so don't, this is like a Harry centric or at least a fourth year Gryffindor centric push. Not yeah. a See, I can see that, but part of me is also like, well, if I know I'm only going to be there a year, I might as well teach everybody the same thing because nobody knows what I know. So I'm going to teach all the kids this. See, I understand that, but I don't believe it yet. I don't, I don't either, know. but I agree with you. Like that That's what I want it to be. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it is. I don't think it is, but okay. I could be wrong. Yeah, no, again, I, for some reason, I just keep coming back to the, he has the one year and that's kind of where I was with it, Melissa. Of, I mean, if this is his one chance and he's specifically here on Double Doors request mm-hmm. to kind of do this, maybe it literally is everyone even the first years or maybe it is just fourth and up like hey we need to get the two extra years that we can compared to six years exposure but um right yeah I'd continue um a lot of the stuff that also happens in this in the previous chapter are um harry communicating with sirius mm-hmm. um we Hedwig get finally back Hedwig's finally back <laughs> and um, angry yeah we get some some emotional Hedwig, which is cool i mean it, there's actually like it's not just a oh we're friends relationship it's a working you know partnership between the two which is it's interesting to see i like that a lot um we get the mention of the owls again first time the mention is directed towards uh four 
before, like this class, like they need to prepare for it for the next year. That's why the, oh, the yeah, the OWL. Yeah, the exams. OWL. Yeah, exams. I'm with you. I was like, we were just so, talking about headache. No. Like, <laughs> yeah, do, do you feel like it's a little early for them to be start to start being prepared for those tests, which um, are going to be at the end of their fifth year? Or no, the way I feel about it is like uh, when you used to take those standardized tests, like in fourth and fifth and all the way up through like to eighth grade and then you do like to prepare you for like the act or the sat or whatever like i just think it's your classes are getting harder like you just have to be learn how to expect to deal with more of a workload kind of thing you start learning responsibility mm -hmm. now right I, so i don't think it's too early or anything i think it's it kind of makes okay. sense um and then we finally get the get to Friday the 30th of October, which is the um, introduction to Durmstrang and the Bobatons uh, arriving, which, at Hogwarts. arriving at Hogwarts, which was pretty cool. Um, I like that uh, Madame Maxine, who is the gigantic woman, uh, made a point to tell Dumbledore, like, our horses are pretty strong. We, like, are you sure your animal caretaker is going to be fine with that? And Dumbledore was like, I think Hagrid's got it. I think I think he'll be all right. So I thought that was funny. And the fun the fact that they uh the horses only drink single malt whiskey <laughs> it was pretty funny yeah do you feel like that's a good choice for the horses i mean if they're that big they're flying horses and they're flying <laughs> maybe okay. that's what we need to start feeding our horses you know <laughs> yeah maybe it's the the malt whiskey that that does the does the magic you know yeah maybe um and then the the skeletal ship uh for Durmstrang that comes out of the middle of the lake that was pretty cool um and the fact that victor crumb is in Durmstrang that's pretty wild so i'm sure that that's going to be interesting for Ron specifically, but I don't really know how that'll play out. So, were you surprised okay. by that? Um, no, because he was the only person on the teams that were mentioned so much in the beginning of the book that I figured he was going to play a part. Whether it was this book or another mm -hmm. one, he was going to be pretty brought well up, featured, yeah, mm -hmm. featured pretty well. So, I kind of expected him to come back, but not really surprised about it at all. Mm -hmm. Any other final thoughts? Um, not not really. Oh. I, we missed this earlier, but I liked that uh, Harry and Ron were just making up their divination predictions. Right. <laughs> like, and it became, like, fatal. I think Harry uh, got decapitated yeah. at the end of one of them. Oh, I just thought so that sad. was funny. And since they did such a good job, they got to do the next month, which, as Melissa pointed out in our episodes, wouldn't make any sense if Trelawney actually believed it because Harry should be dead. Yeah. <laughs> I said he should just put still dead. Still dead. Still dead. Deceased. <laughs> Currently unalive. Like just Each day. Yeah, that's my prediction. Rose from I, the dead? I die. Huh? Rose from the after three days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nope, but that's. I think that's kind of uh, all I got. All right. all right. Are you ready for your five burning questions? Oh, yeah. All right. Question number one. Would you like to have a fur cape as part of your school un uniform like the Durmstrang students? A fur cape? Yes. Mm -hmm potentially if it's cold i mean i'm assuming that they're coming from a place that it's like really cold so it's probably out of necessity excuse me necessity for one uh but i mean yeah if it depending on like what kind of like it was some really cool pelt probably like i was like i don't know i don't even want to name one because i don't want to name something that's like endangered and then like, <laughs> oh, all right we know who took out the last yeah. uh, siberian uh, yeah. penguin skin <laughs> Penguin skin. Okay. Mm. You know okay. what I mean. No. I do. It's, it's I'm more making fun of Luke uh, and his penguin skin. Fictitious uh, animal. Okay. Question number two. If you won the Triwizard Tournament, what would you use your thousand galleon prize money for? Oh, uh, how much does a dragon cost? I want a dragon. I mean, Her uh, Hagrid won one in a game of cards. True. I, I mean, I think a thousand would be a good down payment at the minimum. I, I, I imagine you could get a dragon egg. Yeah. I'd imagine. So. Probably. Okay. I'd want a dragon. It's enough to take the whole Weasley family on a trip to... Uh, That's true. <laughs> Egypt. Egypt. I mean... Or that was that was 300 galleons. Think, yeah. But, so, Still. three trips and then some. <laughs> And a new wand. <laughs> and a couple new wands. <laughs> oh, yeah. I would I would make sure I was outfitted with everything that I, like, needed, though. You know, like a nice All wand, right. nice uh, broomstick. I probably wouldn't be a Quidditch player, though, so. That's okay. All right. Ready for your next question? Yep. Which sounds worse, squeezing booboo tubers for their pus or raising blast and scroots? Mm. 
Probably the boobo tubers. That's just gross. Like, I feel the blast and scroots at the end of the day are living creatures. And if you're just not ignorant, you can find a way to uh, make it work. I feel like. I'm looking at you, Melissa. They are living creatures. She is nope. hanging her head in shame for how ruthless she was against them. I'm trying not to show you the eye roll. However, that plays right into my my point that if I were to receive blast and scroots, I would then re-gift them to all of you because <laughs> my family would be so great with live creatures and, and animals. You guys are so much better than me. Don't give me any scroots, by the way. Especially when no. your scroot eats all of your Christmas cookies. See? Of course, a blast and scroot might just burn it up. Sometimes I would. I think I'd rather have that. That's true. Okay. Question number four. Which is worse? The Imperius Curse or the Cruciatus Curse? Um, Do you remember which is which? Yeah. I think that's tough. It depends on the wielder of the Imperius Curse. Heavily. Okay. Because while the Cruciatus curse is pain and torture, um, and I correct me if I'm wrong, uh, because I know that this is what Neville's family was. Uh, no, I don't know. Um, but I can you die from the Cruciatus curse? It's just pain and torture. As far as we as know. As far as we know, yeah. Okay, then then probably that. But like, you could do something way worse than just being tortured with total control over somebody and like mentally messed them i don't know it's like i don't even know i it, I, it, it, it highly de- depends, highly depends yeah. on the wielder of the imperious curse my only thought would be i think the imperious curse would be worse because it there's it could last for a really long time right like you don't know how long you can be imperialized mm-hmm. for um, remember way back in book one, Hagrid talked about all of these people who were followers of Voldemort. And then he, they were like, oh, no, we were just like cursed. We we were forced to follow him. Like, you have no idea how right. long you might have to be under that and what are the things you're being forced to do. Whereas my assumption would be the Cruciatus curse. You need the direct contact of the paint. So, I mean, no matter how long it lasts, and how bad it is, it can't be longer than years of being mind controlled. True. I, I don't know. That's that. just, I mean, don't get me wrong. I would rather not have any of them happen, but I, I just think living living with the guilt of what you do when you're imperialized might be harder pain, than trying to pain get is over temporary. The physical pain. Yeah, mental it's, pain worse. It's it's a very difficult one because yeah. also yep. the imperious you could be forced to do the Crucius curse on other people. You right. know, like it's it's like do I want to just like bear it myself for however long that's going to last or an infinite possibilities of heinous things that I could be mm-hmm. forced to do to other people. Right. At least, you know, it's localized, <laughs> I guess. And right. it, it's rough. I mean, I'm, yeah, I don't know. I think Imperius is a little more scary to me. I think if you were to ask me, which one would I rather have done to me? I think I would say Cruciatus though. So. All right. Okay. Well, join us uh, in, in <laughs> five weeks when we put the Cruciatus curse on Riley. <laughs> If you would like a chance to put Riley <laughs> under the Cruciatus curse or the Imperial like curse, join booth. our Patreon. Join our Patreon, our <laughs> highest level. It's like a dunking booth. <laughs> like, subscribe, and comment, and you can put a curse on me. <laughs> okay. uh, you heard it here. That was agreement. <laughs> yeah, that, that uh, was legally that was con- that contractually binding. Right. binding. <laughs> awesome. Question number five. Which school, Bobaton or Durmstrang, which school's entrance was more impressive? Oh, Durmstrang. Like, okay. okay. Wow. Flying carriage that's big, sick. I don't know. Like, I thought it, I was expecting it to be way bigger for uh, both Bobaton? schools. Okay. But I felt like the Bobaton's entrance just, I don't know if it was the way I, I read it or the whatever, but it, it just didn't seem that exciting to me. But, and, and the way that both of them were written were not as uh, grand as I thought they were going to be, but just the fact that a giant ship came out from underneath the lake. And I don't know if the lake has any tributaries. I don't know if it's just a lake, if there's a river that like, how'd they get there? That was my question. Like, (laughs) how did they get there? Uh, But I just, I think this ship was way cooler. I don't know. I agree. Okay. All right. Two more questions. Okay. What was your favorite line? Uh, My favorite line was in chapter 11. And it was after um, uh, Mrs. Weasley is talking to her sons about uh, her dad and Mr. and uh, uh, Mad-Eye Moody. And she says, well, your father thinks very highly of Moody. And Fred retorts under his breath. Well, dad collects plugs, doesn't he? So birds of a feather. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> so I, I don't know. I just like that. It, it made me giggle. And I don't know. I think it, the thing that I like the most about the Weasleys, and I think that that's why this is why they their lines usually end up as my favorites, is that their family banter is very similar to ours. So like we could poke fun at each other just like they can. And nobody really gets their feelings hurt unless it's like Percy. Um, but <laughs> Oh, Percy. Yeah. <laughs> and But I don't know. I just thought that was funny. Last one. Who was your section MVP? Um, this is a tough one. Not a lot of people do a lot of stuff. Hermione's definitely the one who's the most driven at her goal, but like I said, I think she went about it the wrong way. Definitely not her. Um, can't choose Harry. He did a lot of stuff, but he just kind of like reacted to a lot of things. He hasn't been very proactive in this section. Um, maybe Ron, you know, he comes up with the idea of just like making up the predictions and the old divination standby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? Make it up? <laughs> uh, but I don't think he really does much. I, all three of them are just kind of reactors. Um, I think the big MVP, honestly, unsung hero of this section is Hedwig. Mm. Uh, Hedwig is sent to find Sirius, not one, one when he's out of the country, and then she comes back. And then two, she's sent back the next morning to go find him. And by the time she does, he's already in the country again in a different hiding spot. And Harry doesn't treat her well until later. And it's October in England, so I'm sure it's decently cold, even for an owl. Um, I think that she does the most work more than anybody else. I, okay. And doesn't get the most doesn't get any praise for it. I can I can respect that. Definitely Hedwig. Riley does a good job of picking out people that we never would have considered <laughs> or characters. Well, he also has to look at a bigger section. Yeah, a swamp. And I also think he puts a lot more thought into it than we do. Nice well, job, Riley. I try. It's the one thing that I get to do like, is pick a character. So <laughs> Well, and I think like I tend to go with people who entertain me and you're like actually picking people who drive plot. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and I also think that Sirius might play a factor in the story. So Hedwig being involved in that development might be important. I don't know. So. All right. So any final thoughts on the section at all? Uh, it really got me excited to read about what actually happens in the tournament and like what actually happens next. So I'm excited to keep reading. Mm -hmm. I'm not like discouraged or anything. Not my favorite section, but. Yeah, I know when we were chatting right before we, I think we started recording, you mentioned it seems like there's a lot of like tension building and cliffhangers mm -hmm. within this section and um, sounds like it's working for you. Yeah. So that's uh, a positive. It doesn't seem like it's uh, on deaf ears, you know, it's like, oh, well, this again, oh, this again. Right. Like, just, just tell me. I'm glad to see that you're motivated and still interested. Yeah, oh, of course. All right. Well, we will see you again after the first task, I believe, is chapter yes. 20. So oh, okay. next time you'll you'll have the first task under your belt. Don't and, even know uh, what that means. But even better. Perfect. And we will see you in six weeks. See All right. Thanks, Thanks for everybody. having me, guys. Bye. See ya. Bye-bye. I would like to give a special shout out to Johnny Gun 2 on iTunes, who just left a great comment for us. Thank you so much for your support. Thanks for listening and tell everyone else, make sure you write and um, rate us on iTunes and leave us a comment that goes a really long way. So we appreciate all of you who have done that. So we've heard from our listener feedback. We've had our special guest Terrence do his what just happened for us. Thank you, Terrence. We've heard from our target audience perspective and our first time reader, Riley. I think that pretty much does it for our five chat recap. What do you think? I think that's it. So if you are looking to hear our unrestricted section, which still exists, but they are available on Patreon. They are available today for all of our wonderful Patreon Imaginary Legion members. You can find us at patreon.com slash stay imaginary. So go ahead, check us out. Some of our past recaps are available for public so you can hear all of our unrestricted sections from earlier in this book. Go on and check it out for free now and then subscribe to get today's. That would be great and we would appreciate that. You can find us on Twitter at NotNamePodcast. You can send us an email at NotNamePodcast at gmail.com. And you can find this show and all of our shows at thepodcastthat.com. Listen to our show on Radio Public. It's free, easy to use, and help support shows like ours we really appreciate you guys hanging in there with us and we're working through book four uh check out patreon.com slash stay imaginary for that exclusive content uh early release for patrons becomes public over time for the unrestricted sections and for things on our other shows as well like subscribe and leave us comments on itunes and youtube and until next time <laughs> 
Join us next week when we discuss chapter number 16. The Goblet of Fire. Stay imaginary. Thanks. <laughs>